Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm so nervous about giving this talk. You know, it, it's like when you go somewhere and give a seminar, if you give a bad talk, you don't worry because you're not going to see the people mostly. But it's like I'm going to see you all around campus. So I, I, I hope this is OK. Um, but the second reason why I'm a little nervous about this talk is that you know I'm very comfortable giving talks that are you know really detailed in the weeds. But I decided I wanted to give a little more of a general talk for you guys today. Um, I want to give you a bit about lemons to lithium how we can squeeze more life out of batteries. And I know this is kind of a weird sort of title, um, but really what I want to do is I want to start out and I want to give you a bit of the background on energy storage. Um, in particular, you know, we all know the word batteries. We've heard the word batteries, um, but I want to go into a little bit of detail about what's really inside of a battery, how a battery works, why it works the way it does, uh, and some of the implications when you start dealing with the way these things work and you start applying them to real world problems. Um, so after some background, I'm going to talk about mechanics. I'm going to talk about how batteries can be thought of as mechanical devices and how we can take advantage of that for optimizing systems through better battery management and even some really new stuff we've been focusing on on using batteries to harvest energy. Um, and then in the end, I want to give a little bit of an outlook for the future. I want to give you a sense of where batteries are today uh, and where they're going tomorrow. Um, and so let's start off with the basic question. Why energy storage? Why does anybody care about energy storage? Uh, and the answer is that we really don't necessarily generate the power where we need it or when we need it, right? So if you think about a traditional power generating system, whether it's a power plant, a wind turbine, or photovoltaics, typically we want to use these things maybe in our cell phone, our car, or our house. I don't know about you, but my house is not located on a power plant. Um, so somehow that energy has to get to my house. And so transmission and distribution is what links the energy generation to the demand in space. But energy storage allows us to link that demand in time. So what I mean by that is to say the sun shines when the sun shines. But I might need that energy at night. Right? So somehow I have to shift that time. And so that's where energy storage becomes absolutely critical. And I think I'm not going out on a limb here by saying that energy storage really is one of the key challenges that we're facing now um, in the 21st century. But before we talk about all of that, uh, we need to kind of set the terms. So, so we need to learn just a little bit about the language. And there's three words that I want you all to remember. Um, the first word is energy. Right? And energy is the thing that allows us to do work. So we can use the units of joules or watt hours or BTUs. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be using things like watt hours and kilowatt hours. Um, power is the rate at which we use the energy. So typically, that's in units of watts. And capacity is the amount of energy we have in a system. So generally speaking, the power is related to the energy simply by dividing it by the time. Now, the first concept when we think about storage to keep in mind is that we're not generating energy out of nothing, right? Energy is always conserved, and we're just converting it from one form into another, right? So whether we take oil and we turn it into electricity to transmit, and then we charge a battery, and then we power a, a consumer electronic or something, we're just changing it from one form into another. And there's lots of ways in which we can put energy. Energy could be in the form of optical energy, light. Uh, it could be in the form of heat. Uh, electrical energy, chemical energy, mechanical energy. These are all forms of energy that we can use. Um, but when it comes to storing that energy, the particular form is going to guide us on what the technology we might want to use. Right? So for instance, one could think of a potato or a piece of broccoli as energy storage. Right? We converted energy from the sunlight into sugars that are stored in a potato. Right? But, well, that's not so practical for powering your car. Um, but we have many options available to us. Pumped hydroelectric, where we can store gravitational energy by water behind a dam. Uh, compressed air storage, where we can put uh, air or CO2 or other types of gases and compress them under high pressures and temperatures. Of course, batteries we'll talk about today. There's various kinds of flow batteries or supercapacitors. 
magnetics, flywheels, thermal storage, lots and lots of different ways to store energy that are available to us. And so all of a sudden, when we start thinking about energy storage, we typically think, oh, wow, I have all these choices. There must be an answer for me out there. If only I could compare these things together, if I could compare a battery to a pumped hydro or something. Um, and it turns out that that becomes a very difficult game. Right? It's a reason why so many of us are specialized into our particular areas in energy storage. Um, and the challenge is that if I try to compare energy storage approaches, right, um, what happens is that it really depends on the application. So the kind of energy storage I need for grid level might be very, very different than the energy storage I need for my laptop. And that itself might be very different from what I need from cars, which might be very different than what I need from, let's say, nano or microelectronics. So putting all of these in one box is not necessarily the most effective way to go about it. Instead, we have to think about the parameters that we're using, and we have to think about what are we trying to get at. Are we trying to maximize the amount of energy we store? Are we trying to maximize the power that can be delivered? Right? Or maybe it's my cell phone and I care about the weight and volume of this thing, but I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of time that my device works. Efficiency, cost, lifetime, shelf life, these are all parameters that we might want to consider when we're thinking about how to select the best energy storage technology. So, you know, you work in this field long enough and people always ask the same question, which is, well, you're a bright guy, why don't you just solve the problem? Okay, just, just fix it, right? Make us a perfect battery. This shouldn't be too hard to do, right? Um, but it turns out that, of course, that's impossible. There's no such thing as a magic device because what we want from this magic energy storage is that it's able to meet the demands of all those different applications. Okay, so we want things to have maximum power but also maximum energy. And what we'll learn is that these are related terms. We learned that earlier and we see that play out in the real world. Um, we want things that can respond very quickly, but yet have a very long life. We want them portable, lightweight, small footprint, but be able to handle very large loads, right? So we can't get all of these things. So the message, the, the, the take home point from this little introduction here is to think about the trade-offs and think about, okay, what do I want to optimize for a given application? And then we can continue to push those innovations forward, okay? And so let's talk about batteries. Let's go back and think about how do we optimize this. And so obviously I start a talk on batteries with a picture of a cat, right? Because that's obvious, isn't it? Well, no, because, you know, let's go back, when we, let's think about energy in general and think about electricity, right? And when we think about electricity, right, at the beginning it was accidental. Lightning struck something, right? Or if you petted a cat or something like that, you got a shock, right? Or, you, well, I guess they didn't have sweaters, but you get the idea. Okay, uh, exactly, exactly, right? Um, but, but it turns out that you can reliably do it, right? You can reliably generate electricity this way by simply static electricity, right? A Van de Graaff generator, right? If you rub amber on fur, you get electricity. The word electron comes from that, right? So that's kind of where things lived. Um, but we don't really start getting into energy storage until the 1700s, right? And in the 1700s, we have this kind of exciting experiment, right, where you take a glass jar and you put a metal foil on the inside and a little bit of metal on the outside, and you charge this up with your static electricity generator, and it turns out that you can store this charge. And that was revolutionary for 1745, okay? And interestingly enough, um, most things in science are named after the scientist that does it, right? Um, but in this case, they named it after the place. So this is known as a Leiden jar. Um, and we know this is a capacitor, right? This is an early version of a, of a capacitor that stores charge electrostatically. Well, as we move on, Ben Franklin showed that I can use this Leiden jar to do stuff. And he was actually studying the nature of lightning, we have the famous Ben Franklin experiment with the kite and the key, uh, and prob probably a graduate student as well. Um, but what happens is that we turn, we, it, it turns out that what we learned from this back in these 1700s is that these Leiden jars can store energy, but they're not very good at storing energy. Okay, I mean, they, they sort of worked for scientific questions, 
um, but it didn't really store all that much energy. But luckily, we didn't really have many small portable electronics in the 1700s. Okay, so we didn't have to worry about it then. And so what we see in the development of energy storage and energy technologies is that the technology can drive the storage and vice versa, right? So we start moving into the 1800s and we start seeing things like telegraphs and other things that require small amount of energy storage. Uh, but luckily, when you got to the late 1700s, we had a really foundational experiment, um, which was Galvani's famous experiment with frogs. Um, so he was kind of a jack of all trades type, um, and he was studying the anatomy and makeup of frogs, uh, and he was dissecting one on the table, and he had a forceps or tool that had two different metals, and he touched the frog in two places, and the leg moved, right? So obviously, he concluded from that that there's some electricity in the frog. Okay, because that would be the obvious conclusion. Um, well, Volta didn't agree, and so this is another person from around this time, and Volta argued that the electricity came from the metals. It turned out they had a very long battle. They you know, wrote letters to each other and they argued, um, but eventually Volta won, um, and Volta figured out that batteries, or the term battery uh, for this device shown here, really comes about from having two different materials. In this case, two different metals. And when I put those metals together in the right way, I'm able to extract energy from them. Okay, and this was the first commercially available battery in 1800. Okay, but if we fast forward from that ancient history and we look to more modern days, what we see is that battery technology really hasn't changed much since the 1800s. Okay, um, if you take a look at batteries you're familiar with, Right, lead acid battery for your car, that was from 1859. It's the same technology today, right? Nickel cadmium rechargeable batteries, 1899. They got replaced by metal hydride in the 90s, right? We have alkaline batteries that go back to the 1860s. But there's something that stands out on this and that's lithium based systems. And all of those are very recent. Okay, so what we start seeing here is that lithium starts becoming important in the 1960s. What happened in the 1960s? People knew that lithium was around as a material. They knew its properties, right? What's interesting is that what drove that was a need for, in this case, port uh, uh, implantable biological devices, right? Heart uh, defib defibrillators and things like that, pacemakers and things like that, that required a battery that can store a lot of energy in a very small package so that it would last a long time. So all of a sudden, we have this driving force for better batteries coming about in the 1960s and 1970s. And what makes lithium so special? Well, for us to understand what makes lithium special, we have to kind of understand what's inside of a battery to begin with, okay? So a battery is pretty much all electrochemistry. Or not, we'll have to save that one for a little bit, right? But generally speaking, in a battery, what I'm doing is I'm converting uh, energy from electrical energy or into electrical energy from chemical energy. Okay, so it's chemical energy to electrical energy that I'm using. And this happens through oxidation and reduction reactions. So that you're going to have to go back to your high school chemistry to remember what those things are. But generally speaking, when you have things that want to happen spontaneously, you can get a battery or a fuel cell or you can get corrosion like rust or something. And if you have something that requires energy to take place, well, then you can electro deposit, you can polish, you can plate. But the thing to remember is that systems always try to lower their energy, okay? So if I take two different metals, I take silver and I take zinc and I put them together, they're gonna react and they're gonna react and they're gonna give off their energy. And that's not useful for a battery. What I need to do to make a battery is I have to control that interaction. And that's what batteries do. They harness the energy from those reactions. And the way that works is by separating these into two separate reactions. Okay, and this is kind of a classic picture from you know, a basic chemistry type course. But what it does is it says, I am gonna create some part of this system, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Um, that I'm going to call the anode. And I'm going to say that's where oxidation occurs. Okay, so that's where a material, it gives up its electron. That electron then runs through the system and does work, 
and it recombines over here at the cathode to complete the loop, okay? And that's where reduction occurs. And I keep these things isolated by having this, this bridge, this gap, this thing that only allows certain things to move, okay? Um, and so it turns out that neither reaction can occur unless both can occur. And so this is how we create a battery. What we do in a battery is we basically separate these reactions and we allow them to occur only when we connect the battery to the rest of the circuit. And that allows the electrons to flow and it allows the reaction to take place. And so what a battery is in general is it's a compact form of that big electrochemical system with beakers and salt bridges and things like that. We still have an anode and a cathode and the electrons still flow through some circuit to create the light or whatever is uh, being powered. But in between I have this, what's called an electrolyte slash separator. This, this material that separates these two sides of the battery so that they can't react when I don't want them to react, okay? And so pretty much all batteries work the same way. The details are a little different. The materials are a little different, but basically they do the same thing, okay? And just a term you may have heard, primary means non-rechargeable, secondary means a rechargeable cell. Okay, so let's go back to our old friend, the lemon or the potato, whichever you prefer, okay? Um, and you guys all did this experiment when you were in grade school, right? You took a lemon or a potato or a lime or something, right? You stuck a galvanized nail into it, you stuck another wire into it, and then you connected it to something and it, you know, lit up a little light or it powered a clock or it did something, right? Um, and that's pretty much exactly the same thing as the Volta pile. What we have here is we have a reaction occurring with zinc and we have a reaction occurring with hydrogen. And when these two things occur, I'm able to extract energy from the system. So I'm able to convert the chemical energy of a lemon into electrical energy that I can use to then convert to light or something like that. Okay, and that's a battery. But the corollary to this is that in batteries, the easiest reaction is the one that's going to occur. And that means that if there's side reactions, there's other things that could happen that could harm the productivity of a battery. And this is where we wind up getting into secondary batteries. This is why some batteries are really good at being recharged and some are not. And so when we have a battery that's rechargeable, what we need to do is we need to minimize these other kinds of effects. The lemon is not a particularly rechargeable battery. Okay, if I take a lemon and I connect electricity to it, it doesn't become a super lemon, right? Or anything like that, okay? Instead, what happens is when the reaction occurs, I give off hydrogen gas and the hydrogen is gone, okay? But other materials happen to be very good at being rechargeable. They have minimal or we could control the side reactions. We can prevent the decay of the structures as things move around. Um, we can avoid the growth of bad things like metals. Um, we can hopefully keep costs down and we can get an appropriate uh, power output from these systems. Um, but this really pushes that challenge, that challenge I said of trying to create batteries that have high capacity and energy density, but also are rechargeable, okay? So what do we do? What we do is we give a Nobel Prize this year to lithium ion batteries, okay? Because that's the answer to that particular problem. How do I make a battery that's very rechargeable, that has a high energy density, is able to give off a lot of power? Well, we turn to a lithium ion battery. Um, these three folks here uh, just won the prize. Um, and the magic of a lithium ion battery is that, first of all, lithium is very lightweight. Okay, and second of all, lithium is very reactive. And so when you put those things together, what you find is that the energy density is quite high relative to things like lead, things that are very heavy, mm -hmm. but its power is also quite high. And so lithium ion batteries become the go-to type of energy storage system when you're dealing with things like portable electronics, implantable medical devices, automobiles. Right? These are areas where weight matters. 
um, and where the power density and energy density matter. Okay? And the idea of lithium ion is actually truly worthy of the Nobel Prize. Okay? So lithium ion batteries are ever so slightly different in a very important way. Um, so the way a lithium ion battery works is that it doesn't just move electrons around, it also moves ions. So when I start with the cell, let's take a battery that's fully discharged and I'm going to charge it up. What happens is that all of the lithium is over on one side of the battery. For argument's sake, it might not be all of it, but just work with me on this, right? And then what I do is I put energy in. And what happens is that that lithium moves to the other side. In this case, it moves from the cathode to the anode. And when it moves to the other side, it inserts itself into the material. And that's called intercalation, okay? So the material has an arrangement of atoms and the lithium kind of shoves itself in the middle there. And this goes on until my anode is completely filled. When I discharge, it simply goes the other direction. The lithium goes back, um, the lithium goes back until it's empty. And so this insertion and deinsertion makes lithium ion batteries a very special material system. And it makes it a very rich system that includes mechanical forces um, and other types of interactions. So the message from this first introductory part is to say that the intercalation process, this last little thing that I told you about, makes lithium ion batteries very special. Okay, so not only are lithium ion batteries really good, but we need to understand how this insertion and deinsertion affects the performance in these systems. And so that's going to bring me to the mechanical properties. And so, you know, just as a reminder, in case anybody fell asleep in the last 10 minutes, um, you know, batteries are nice and compact. We need them everywhere, right? And they all basically look the same. And so when we start thinking about these from an application perspective, and we start saying, well, why is a lemon not a good battery for a car? Why don't I just fill my gas tank with lemons or something, right? Well, they're not overly safe, they're not durable, and they're not very reliable. I guess lemons are relatively safe, but you get the idea, okay? I, I don't know if anyone has been hurt by a lemon. Um, it could be on, in, yeah. okay. Um, okay, so we need to deal with these kinds of things. And so what we deal with in my group, the kind of research that we study, is we study how the mechanical properties affect the electrochemical performance in these systems. And we've been studying this for many years now. And so just to kind of tell us what, what is mechanics, what, what do I mean by this? Well, let's start with this intercalation process. Okay, so when I move, when I take a lithium ion and I try to shove it inside of a material, the material has to expand. Okay, there's not enough space in there. And so what happens is that the lithium comes in and the material expands a little bit. That expansion is mechanical deformation. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. And when I put that into a can, it can't freely expand. It gets constrained, okay? And so I get expansion due to that. But, you know, oh, sorry. And then, you know, certain materials expand a lot. So graphite expands by like 10%, whereas silicon, one of the more modern materials for batteries, can expand as much as 400%. So this could be a huge amount of expansion. Um, the other thing that could happen is I could get temperature effects. Uh, so for instance, thermal expansion. If my battery is uh, charging and discharging and it heats up a little bit, it can expand. Um, I can have phase transformations where the material reorganizes itself. Um, I can plate or otherwise put layers or coatings like a uh, solid electrolyte interface or other metals on top of these surfaces. All of those things are going to change the shape of my battery. So in fact, if you have an old iPhone or an old laptop and the battery was bad or something, you might take the battery out and you might see that the whole thing is like swollen up, okay? That's expansion that comes in many cases from gas generation uh, in those systems. Um, but the forces don't only come from internal places. They could come from the external, for, uh, externally. So for instance, when you make a battery, you constrain it to be inside of a can. And in many cases, in very high-powered batteries, you might have to put it under a lot of pressure, or I like to use the term stress, in order to prevent this thing from uh, expanding and falling apart. Um, you might have other types of mechanical loadings designed in. Um, you might have temperature variation if my battery is very cold 
or it's very warm, its size is going to change. And you might have unintentional mechanical loadings. You, you might sit on your phone, right, or something like that, which is going to be a stress. Um, and so when you think about these issues related to mechanics, the reason why we've been working at it so long is that it's not a simple problem. Okay, mechanics happens on all different size scales in a battery. So at the smallest level, I have the individual atoms that are arranged in a particular way. And there's mechanics that occur at that level. And those little atoms are arranged into particles. And those particles can expand and contract. They can crack. Other things could happen. And we care about that level of mechanical detail. Um, but also, when I start scaling it up to a cell, I have these things working together with other particles and other materials. And ultimately, all the way up to the macro scale, let's say a car or something like that. So mechanics spans across this length scale. And these geometric constraints can really change the situation. And it can complicate things greatly. Um, and so one of the kind of the big conclusions that we came up with over the years um, is that mechanical evolution in a battery is coupled to the electrochemical performance. So what I mean by that is that batteries that are, let's say, working well one day and then they start getting worse and worse, you've seen that in your cell phone, right, where it stops working as well. Um, well, what happens in some cases is that you get mechanical effects, which then make the electrochemistry worse which then makes the mechanics worse, which then makes the electrochemistry worse, and you wind up with positive feedback loops. So one of the big things we've been working on is to kind of break these positive feedback loops in batteries so that they don't lead to harmful runaway behavior and things like that. Um, and so the kind of key point, though, for today's talk in this relationship is that mechanics gives me a way to look at the electrochemistry. Okay, and it's a unique way to look at the electrochemistry. And with that window, I can determine something about how batteries operate. Um, and so let's talk about some of the problems with batteries. Um, so I started my talk with a picture of a cat. So obviously, I'm going to talk about problems of batteries with a picture of a cup of coffee. Okay, um, why do I have a cup of coffee? Well, a cup of coffee is a pretty simple device, right? I put coffee in and I take coffee out. And the amount of coffee I put in is exactly equal to how much I get out. OK, that was not too complicated. We all got that, right? Unfortunately, batteries don't work that way. If I put energy into a battery, I can't always get it back out again, or at least not always all of it, OK? And that's what makes batteries complicated. That's why it's really hard to predict how long your cell phone is going to last before it runs out of power. Or more importantly, how far is my car going to go before it runs out of power, right? So that's kind of a problem with batteries. And the challenge there is how do we determine how much charge I currently have in my battery, right? How, much, how many miles can my car go? Or more importantly, what is the health of my battery? How many more times can I cycle my battery? How many times can I recharge my computer before the battery is no longer any good? Okay, And those are two metrics that are very, very difficult to get at. Now, what people do is that they use all sorts of complicated algorithms. Okay, They measure the amount of charge it went in and how much they got out. And your iPhone has all of this built into it. And it gives you that little number, 10% left or 5% left. And then it dies two seconds later. You know, I mean, that's just how good these algorithms are. right? But as we start talking about something like a car, Right? We're all comfortable with seeing a fuel gauge. Um, but it's really hard to do that for a battery uh, system, for an electric vehicle. Because you know, where my phone dies right away, it's not a big deal. Maybe I don't get a text. But if my car dies, I'm in the middle of the road somewhere. Right? So we need to do a little better about this. Um, and so it turns out it's hard to do. And so what do we do about that? Well, in our case, what we did is we were studying the mechanics. And we said, you know, if mechanics gives us a window to the electrochemistry, maybe I can use the mechanical measurements to tell me about how much charge is left in my battery or how many more cycles can my battery go. And it turns out that this is exactly how it works. And so we were doing a bunch of experiments where we were measuring the amount of force this battery generates as it charges and discharges. And this is the result of one of our experiments. What you have here is a plot of the stress which is the force per unit area, uh, versus the time. And what I'm doing is I'm charging and discharging batteries that are held in this 
fixture. So I'm measuring this force, right? And what you see is that the force increases and then it decreases when it discharges. And it's actually quite a large effect. You could see this oscillation is actually very measurable. It's very clear. Not only that, but it's also relatively linear, which is a nice thing. And it turns out that this is a very simple way to measure how much charge is in your battery. Okay, without having to count the number of electrons I've used or how many electrons I've put in, all I simply need to do is calibrate the stress. And I can measure that with very simple devices that are out there. And this stress is going to depend on my state of health, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But it turns out that this is a very repeatable way to go about the problem. So measuring the mechanical properties can tell me the state of charge. Um, but it turns out um, that you can also use this to measure the state of health. You can also use this to predict how many more cycles I can get out of my battery. And that's kind of a holy grail sort of thing. Um, but if you take a look at this data here, okay, this is another plot of another experiment we did. Um, and there's a couple things to notice. In this plot here, we could see the plot of the capacity versus the cycle number. So this means how much energy is still in my battery versus the number of cycles that I go. And what you see here is high, medium, low, and unconstrained. And that's talking about how much pushing I'm doing on this battery. If I'm pushing a lot on it, it's high. And if I'm pushing a little on it, it's low. And just to give you perspective, the maximum is about that much force, about as much force as you can squeeze with your finger against your, your hand. Okay, So it's not a lot of force. Um, and what you could see here is that well, the amount of that force can affect the lifetime significantly, right? If there's a lot of force, the battery dies very quickly. And if there's less force, the battery can last a long time. Now, we studied a lot of that, and we kind of understand why that happens. And it has to do with localized phenomena and other things we're not going to talk about here. Um, but what I want you to, to look at here is that if I were to measure the stress versus the cycle number instead of the capacity, what you see is that it continues to creep upwards, regardless of the level. Okay, So what this tells me is that this increase in the stress state is actually related to what's going on electrochemically. And so I can understand this by thinking about how much this thing is trying to expand and contract. And as I charge it and discharge it, it's expanding and contracting. But overall, it's generally expanding. Okay, with each cycle, it gets a little bit wider, a little bit wider, a little bit wider, right? And that's consistent with all kinds of mechanisms for electrochemical degradation. It's consistent with intercalation problems, with irreversible volume things, with SEI growth. These are all fancy terms to say that the lithium is not participating in the reaction as much as it was at the beginning of when this battery was fresh, right? And so these electrochemical effects are appearing in the mechanical measurements. And so what do we do with that, or how do we understand that? Well, what we do is we make plots, right? That's what we basically, we got data, let's plot it. And let's look at the plots. And so the first plot that we looked at was a plot of the stress versus time to the 1 half power. The reason we do time to the 1 half power is that it, that's related to diffusion. That's related to the growth of something. It's kind of a standard relationship that we see a lot in materials. And what we see here is a nice uh, linear relationship. Uh, it appears that this stress is related to the growth of some kind of feature in this cell. Um, but that's maybe less satisfying for you. Um, I think the more satisfying one is if I say, look, what I really care about is the state of health. How many more cycles until my battery dies, right? And if I plot the stress versus the number of cycles left, what I see is this beautiful straight line, right? And even an engineer like myself can understand that a straight line is something that I can model really easily, right? And so we can take this and we can simply use it as an indicator for the state of health of the material. And it turns out it's not an accident, right? If I look at other batteries, I look at other systems, I see this nice straight line, except for when I don't, right? And it turns out that that's OK, because when I don't, that's a battery that's about to explode. Right? And so it turns out that not only can I determine how much life is left, but if I have something that's bad things are going on, I have a signature that I can use to try to prevent that battery from getting catastrophic and blowing up like we hear about on the news. 
right? So these kinds of relationships are things that carry through on a number of different batteries, a number of different lithium ion battery systems that we've tried, and it gives us a way to go about uh, managing systems. Um, and so again, we, we propose that our mechanism has to do with the growth of these layers as the lithium comes out of the reaction, it deposits itself on the surface, and that allows this battery to continue to expand. But basically, we have this nice, straightforward relationship that we can use. Um, so why do we care about any of this, right? Well, the first thing is to say that the use of mechanical properties of batteries to monitor the electrochemical behavior is something that's currently going on in industry, right? So uh, a colleague of mine, or former colleague of mine, started up a company that measures mechanical properties of batteries and tries to get at the state of health and state of charge, as well as the safety uh, in these systems. Um, but also, more importantly, in the real world, typically we're dealing with many, many batteries altogether, or I should say a lot of cells that come together to provide what's called a pack. Okay? And so if you have a Tesla Model S, congratulations. Um, if you have a Nissan Leaf, no, sorry. Um, if you have a Tesla Model S, this is what your battery looks like. Okay, it has a bunch of these small little cylindrical batteries all packed together, right? If you happen to have a Nissan Leaf, your batteries are a little different form factor, but there's still a lot of them there. And this presents a real big control problem. How do I control my Tesla so that I don't let one bad battery over here affect the overall system? Well, if I can measure the mechanics of it, I can determine the state of each individual cell. I can now put it into a more complex management system, and I could go about controlling this to improve the lifetime, to improve the capacity, to improve the power state of the system. And same goes for something like a Nissan LEAF, which actually is a little bit of an easier uh, system to, ma to manage in that way. Um, so once again, if I know how an individual battery is behaving, if I can probe it with mechanics, I can use that to tell me about the electrochemistry. And I can use that to optimize performance, safety, or lifetime in a system. Okay? So that's one example. That's one example of where mechanics allows me to understand something about the electrochemistry, and it allows me to do something particularly useful uh, in the systems. Um, let's see here. Okay, so um, I still have some more time, and so I want to move on to this next sort of interesting little side quirk of mechanics and batteries, which is energy harvesting. So if I were to ask you all, is a battery a device that stores energy or harvests energy? You would probably say it stores energy, right? That's kind of the definition of a battery. Uh, but it turns out that when you understand the relationship between mechanics and electrochemistry, and you understand a little bit of thermodynamics, um, you can actually turn a battery around and you can use it to harvest energy. And I know that sounds a little weird, but you know, folks have seen pictures of like harvesting energy from shoes or something like that. You should forget those pictures. They're mostly cartoons, okay? They're not the real world, so don't get excited. We're not gonna be powering your laptops from walking around on your shoes. Um, but you can harvest energy from something called piezoelectricity, right? And piezoelectricity is like a kind of a kind of neat material science thing, right? It's what allows you to start a barbecue grill. You push a button and then there's a little spark that generates, that gets generated. Well, what you have is you have a material that has a particular arrangement of atoms in it. And when you push on that material, what happens is, is you shift the location of one of the atoms in that structure. And when you do that, it creates a potential or it creates an electric field. And if I could create a large enough electric field, I can create a shock that you know, can light up a barbecue grill or something like that, or I can use that to harvest energy from the pushing on this crystal, okay? Um, and that's a kind of a standard well-known phenomenon. Um, it happens to be very fast because you're just kind of pushing charge around, um, and it happens to go forward and backwards, right? So if I apply an electric field, the material gets bigger or smaller, and if I squeeze on it, I get an electric field. Okay, so that's a well-known material. Now, what I want to argue to you is that batteries are kind of the same thing. In the case of a battery, when I intercalate lithium into the structure, I change its voltage, I change its potential. And so, 
we know that as I change the potential, as I charge and discharge a battery, I know that I can get some strain. That's what we talked about in the first part of the talk, right? So the question becomes, if I take a battery and I squeeze it, will I be able to force the lithium in and out of the crystal and change the potential of this material? And that's the question that we weren't sure about. It took us about eight or nine years, but eventually we became sure about the answer, and the answer is yes. You can do that, and it does work, but it's a very small effect, okay? And so let's see how that plays out. So what we can do is we can take a battery. I'm going to call this the test, and this is just a commercial off-the-shelf battery that you can buy uh, from Amazon or anywhere else, um, and I'm going to have a reference battery that's exactly the same voltage. So I'm going to squeeze one and not the other, and I'm going to compare them. Okay? And when I do that, if I measure a change in voltage, I can relate that change in voltage to the amount of stress or the amount of pressure that I apply to this system. Okay? Now, it turns out that each electrode, the anode and the cathode, is going to have some relationship between its voltage and the stress. And so I'm going to have to add those two up, but in the right conditions, they don't cancel out. Okay? And so if we do this experiment, here's the results that we got. What we saw is that as we increased the stress, the voltage went up. And it was this nice, beautiful, linear behavior. You see, I like linear things. They're easy to understand, right? Um, and the slope of this is that K that I talked about before. Uh, and typically, we're talking about small effects, a few millivolts per gigapascal. And a gigapascal is, uh, again, this is about a megapascal. So a gigapascal is a thousand times that, just to give you something that has no meaning. Um, but in any event, um, it means something to me. Um, and so what it means to me is that if I could change the voltage of one battery relative to another one by simply squeezing on it, then I can do this interesting little thermodynamic experiment. Okay, what I can do is I could take two batteries next to each other and I could squeeze one of them. So now the voltage of this one is a little higher than this one, okay? Now what's going to happen is that charge is going to flow from this battery to that one until eventually they're at the same level, and then charge doesn't flow, okay? Now if I uncompress this one, I get rid of the stress, the voltage drops, and now the charge is going to flow back, okay? Now you think that that seems like a perpetual motion machine, right? But it's not because the potential is different. And so when you do this process, you squeeze it, let it discharge, unsqueeze it, let it leak back again, what you find is that there's area under this curve. They're not the same because the energy is related to charge and voltage. Okay? And so as a result, I'm actually harvesting energy in this process. And it turns out that we can do this in a number of different ways, but in our first experiment that we did this on, in fact, we were able to show that we were harvesting a good bit of energy. We were harvesting a little less than a millijoule per cycle, which again, you're not going to power your cell phones with it or anything like that. Um, but this is a measurement that tells us that the physics works the way that we think it does. That in fact, you can turn batteries around when you play with the mechanics. And so, you know, our mechanical energy here, I, I like to be honest about things. Um, we put in a lot of mechanics and we only got an efficiency of about 0.15%. Um, but we got something out of it, right? You gotta give us some credit for that, right? Um, but no, in all seriousness, um, we've done quite a bit of modeling on this and we believe that you can actually push it up to a few percent efficiency just because there's a lot of loss in the system because we're not using an optimizer. We're using a commercial off-the-shelf battery. It'd take out your cell phone is what we're kind of doing, okay? But this is the first demonstration of this type of harvesting from a non-optimized commercial system, and we continue to push this uh, forward. Um, but you might ask, well, well, who cares? Why does this matter? It's such a small amount of energy. Well, the answer is that it's not really that small of amount of energy. Okay, if you think about other forms of energy harvesting, they're actually much lower energy density. So you need a lot more electrostatics to, to be able to harvest this much energy or a lot more piezoelectrics. And so when you have systems that are small, there's potential to use this for harvesting energy. Um, and as we understand this phenomenon more, you know, we hope to be able to expand on our, on our knowledge base. Um, so with that, I want to shift off of the research and I want to talk about the outlook. So where do we go now that we've heard a little bit about batteries, we learned about lemons and lithium, 
right? We learned how they're related and not related. Um, but, you know, I think the question to ask is, where are we today with our state of understanding of batteries and where are we going? Well, I kind of showed you about how the mechanics, how we're getting a handle on the mechanics. And by understanding the mechanics, we're better able to control batteries, we're better able to design batteries, we're better able to make safer types of batteries. Um, but ultimately, the real world has got batteries in cars already, right? And so, you know, if you think about the, the lithium ion uh, batteries, um, they're really dominating the landscape of energy storage these days, right? Whenever we think of energy storage, we immediately jump to lithium ion batteries. But there are a number of different chemistries out there, and these chemistries cause different, let's say, tweaks in terms of the type of energy and power that they, that they supply. Um, lithium cobalt oxide or lithium iron phosphate are two very common ones you would find in your cell phone or maybe in certain vehicles. Um, nickel manganese cobalt, nickel cobalt aluminum, uh, this would be a Tesla uh, oops, uh, technology there. Um, these are all very common types of battery systems. Um, but ultimately the question that always comes up when we talk about the real world is talking about cost, right? Why aren't we all driving around in electric vehicles today? Right? And the answer is because it's, it's, it's not cost effective. The Teslas are still expensive, right, relative to gas-powered cars and things like that. And if you take a look, this was a data that was put together uh, back in 2012. Um, and this talks about how much batteries cost versus the price of gasoline. And it says, okay, look, if gasoline is a certain price point, how cheap do I have to make a battery to be able to compete against that? And what we see here is that when gas is very inexpensive, it's almost impossible to have electric type vehicles be competitive because gasoline is just too cheap. And so in this region here is where uh, internal combustion engines tend to win out hybrid vehicles, plug-in hybrids, and electric vehicles. Now, what you see though is that as the price of gas moves up, this becomes more competitive. Today, the price of gas is around $2.60 or so a gallon, right? So we're somewhere up in this region here and interestingly enough, the current cost of battery packs for cars is around 175 or so. I've seen numbers ranging from 130 to 150 to 170, but put it in that ballpark, right? So we're right about on the cusp right now, right? So it's kind of an exciting time, but when you put it all together, people typically say, you've got to get to a target of around $100 a usable kilowatt hour. Okay, and the costs are still too high. This is data from 2015. But if we actually look at data from the mo most recent data, um, you could see here that we're down to about 100, and, like I said, 175. So we're getting closer, and it's falling uh, very quickly. And in fact, they estimate um, that we're going to reach that level by next year. Originally, it was supposed to be 2028, then 2025, and now it's looking like 2020. So it's actually a very exciting time for battery technology with respect to the overall larger picture in the real world. Um, but the question is, how do we get there? What is the driving force for the costs of batteries, particularly lithium ion batteries? And it turns out that if I were to take a battery and, and figure out what the costs are to build that thing, about half of the costs come from the raw materials. The other half comes from the cost of the operations of a factory, um, the cost of the workers, the cost of insurance, taxes, all this other overhead that goes in. But about half of it is the cost of the materials. And if you look, you know, the types of different, you know, so Tesla uses NCA, which is a, a nickel, uh, cobalt, and aluminum. You can see it's primarily nickel in that. Um, iPhones are cobalt oxide, it's mostly cobalt. Um, the leaf is manganese, which is much cheaper. Uh, NMC is a power wall. You can see different amounts of different materials. And so, big deal. So what? Well, the problem is this. This is the price of cobalt over the last, you know, 15 years, right? And you could see that it can spike, whoops, it can spike up, it can change, it could be low, it could be high. So we have variability in the pricing side of this thing, right? And that's going to affect the viability of a particular technology, especially ones that are heavy on cobalt, right? But actually, all batteries need to have lithium in them. And this actually shows an interesting challenge with lithium. Um, so this is the price of uh, global prices of lithium carbonate, lithium hydroxide. Those are precursors to making the lithium that goes in your batteries, right? And what you can see here is that the price has been climbing up, right? So back in 2016, it was around $20,000 per metric ton. 
Um, just to give you a, like a small can of a battery probably has a 10 to 20 grams of, bat of, of lithium in it. Say a Tesla Model S might have, I don't know, 30 or 40 kilograms or something like that. Maybe, maybe a little more on that order though, right? Um, and so these big price peaks by a factor of four is a big issue, right? Um, and so again, these are driven by global challenges, right? And, and you know, folks in this room know way more about that kind of stuff than I do. Um, but the point is, is that this is one of the challenges that, that one has to overcome. Uh, another one of the challenges that we need to overcome, something that we study in my group, has to do with things uh, known as the number of cycles or the energy density. And so when you think about a car, or you think about your phone, let's think about how many times you have to charge and recharge that system, right? If you take home your phone, you plug it in every day, that's 360 cycles a year, where you're charging and discharging, charging and discharging, right? Now, a typical rechargeable battery might get 1,000 to 2,000 cycles, right? So now you're talking about how many years can this thing go? That's plenty good for a cell phone where the technology advances every couple years, right? But you want your car to last 10 years right, or 20 years in some cases. So this cycle life becomes a very important parameter. Um, and so there's targets, right? The targets that the uh, Advanced Battery Consortium set is to have si about 1,000 cycles before it decays, but we're not there yet on these really high power systems uh, for cars. Um, and so these are things that we have to focus on. Um, and again, the last thing that I'll say that we need to focus on, uh, you know, in this outlook is system management. So proper usage of battery, instead of just looking to make batteries that have different materials in that, that takes eight years, it takes a decade. But if I can better manage the system and control the system, I can make it last longer, okay? So I could get those cycles up, I could get my capacities up. And this is an active area of research for many folks. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities out there today for any younger folks out here who are saying, oh, I wanna get interested in batteries. There's so many ways in which we can focus on making them better, right? We can focus on the material aspects. We could focus on commercial systems and trying to make those better. Um, we could think about safety. How do we move away from this idea that I'm worried about a battery blowing up so I can't take it on an airplane to, okay, everyone bring your battery. Um, you know, how do I improve energy and power, cycle life, uh, various improvements in modeling? These are all areas where people are focusing um, we're focusing in a lot of them, um, and the hope is to make batteries better. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank the folks who do all the work here. Uh, over the years, funding from various places, including from PEI here through the Grand Challenges, uh, as well as CMI a number of years back. Um, thank you all for listening, and, and uh, I'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Now I'm pushing 130, so. Yes? I did not focus on them, no. Yes. Yes. It is practical to think about, um, but there's challenges with this, right? So, so it, when it turns out, like, the, the bigger issue with temperature is not what's going on outside. I mean, that is important, and that affects a lot of things. But the bigger problem is that when you have a battery and you're, you're running it, you're, 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 on a, you're in a car, you're accelerating, you're decelerating, it's generating heat. That's a natural part of it. And heat tends to be bad, all right? It tends to cause side reactions to occur. It tends to degrade the overall performance. And so controlling that temperature is actually very critical. Um, temperature ultimately leads to catastrophic failure and things. Now, when you have a low temperature, the challenge with lithium batteries is that their conductivity is not as good, or the rate at which I can move lithium ions back and forth is pretty bad. Um, and so now you have maybe a starting problem. You know, if your car's been sitting at a low temperature, now it's a little bit sluggish or something. Um, but generally speaking, these are things that are, that are actively part of the management algorithms um, in vehicles. You mean like when you plug it into the airplane seat, or do you mean like that they won't allow you to bring it on a plane? Yeah, so the reason is, is because, you know, batteries sometimes 
blow up. Right? I've got to be honest with you. Um, usually there's a reason for that. In a lot of cases, we can figure out before it happens. But the challenge is, is that if you're an airplane, you're, you're an airplane you know, company or somebody who sells seats on an airplane, they don't know the state of your battery. Um, and so they don't want it in the hold where they really get you. Typically, they'll make you carry it, but not let you check it in a bag or something like that. Um, for us, it's just an inconvenience, if anything. But it's actually a bigger issue related to you know larger transport of batteries from place to place. Like, how do if I want to buy a battery from China or from Korea, how do I get it here to the U.S.? And it becomes a challenging aspect of you know of planning and of logistics. And I think that you know as we have a global society and batteries are coming from all over the world. This is a challenge that I think people are, are dealing with. Yeah. Well, not usually. So, so, I mean, those are the catastrophic failures that we hear about. Um, but, you know, I think all of us are comfortable having a cell phone in our pocket without the fear that it's going to blow up at any second, right? Um, and so, generally speaking, these things do have indicators before it happens, um, but not always. There are rare occurrences. Um, and so, you know, again, I think we tend to see the press stories that show, you know, oh, a car caught fire, and, you know, we don't hear the stories about a, you know, uh, an internal combustion engine car that, you know, caught fire because it, you know, got into an accident or something either, right? So, so I think we're just sensitive to it now in a way that, that, you know, as we become more knowledgeable about how to understand it and control it, I think we'll be more comfortable with the technology that we have. Yes, Mr. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't talk about that, um, but that's an important management thing. So, so the the issue here that, that's being raised is that if I take a battery and I discharge it all the way, and you know, then I recharge it, I'll only be able to do that so many times. But if I discharge it only halfway, I can do that a lot more. Okay. So that's called the depth of discharge. And it turns out that, yes, this is, a, this is kind of a bigger issue. And this is one way to extend the lifetime of, say, batteries in a car, which is that you'll have more batteries than you need, but you just won't discharge them. Anymore. So now their lifetime will be a lot longer. Um, and so this is kind of a trick that we use. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an issue. So yeah, so... so it's actually interesting. So we, we actually did a paper on this a number of years back, um, looking at different battery chemistries and looking at you know, various effects of charge, full charge, half charge, things like that. Um, well, our latest understanding is that when you fully charge a battery, you're actually at a maximum stress state, which is actually pr could potentially lead to bad things happening. But you're also at a maximum electrochemical state, which can lead to side reactions occurring as well. Now, I'm not sure exactly why Apple manages their systems the way they do, um, but what I can say is that they're going to do that in order to extend lifetime and extend safety, right? So typically, what they're talking about is that if you do go all the way up to the top, chances are that you really are pushing the, the limits of things and you're just closer to the edge, um, and so no reason to do that. Now, conversely, say something like Tesla's NCA, those batteries have really good capacity, but they do tend to have to be pushed to their limits a little bit more. And I think there, there's a lot more effort put into controlling and understanding compared to maybe what they do in a, just a simple pack on a cell phone kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see, beryllium? No. Um, <laughs> sorry. No. Um, so a number of us are working on different chemistries. We've done a lot of work on magnesium over the years. Um, we've more recently been looking at calcium. To be perfectly blunt with you, I'm not sure that Lithium's really good, and there's an awful lot of it in the Earth, okay? The challenges of cost of lithium has to do with distribution of where it's found in the Earth and who controls it, which is a political question that, that I certainly can't answer. Um, but, you know, it's hard to beat lithium for the applications where it's really good at. Now, if I'm looking at, say, a, a, a grid-level stationary system, now all of a sudden I think you have a lot more things that could come into play. Sodium is actively studied. Um, other types of systems there. Um, but I think that what we're going to find, and this is just my own personal thing, is that, you know, I think what we're going to find is that we're going to develop this, this, you know, collection of different batteries. And we're going to find that certain batteries are really good for certain applications. So the battery that we put in our cell phone is going to be a little different than the battery we're going to put in our car. 
but ultimately it will be optimized for the particular application. And some of that might mean going to different chemistries, some of it might be going to different ions, um, and you know, things like that. I mean, to be honest, lead acid battery, it's not bad, okay? It still does the job that we need it to do, um, and it's really cheap, and lead is incredibly recyclable, right, uh, compared to lithium and other kinds of materials. So when you start throwing the rest of the environmental sustainability at this, all of a sudden, there's other things to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, so um, so you mean how to use mechanics as a monitoring device is what you're saying? Is the question or? Yeah, yeah. So, so I would say that so current technology, so especially in say high power vehicles, right? Things like uh, high powered applications like vehicles. Um, typically, you're applying a force that's on the high side, uh, a few megapascals to hold everything together. Okay, um, and that's kind of necessary at these these rates that are going. So all of a sudden now we need to think about how that affects the lifetime of these uh, cells uh, moving forward. Um, People have done a lot of instrumentation work on, you know, putting stress in very particular ways on locations in batteries, uh, particularly some groups at Michigan have done some really fantastic work on this where they, you know, outfitted uh, real world batteries from cars and looked at how it plays out. So um, people are doing these sorts of things. But in, the, in practically applications today, there is a relatively large amount of force on these systems. Yeah. 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 So, so thermal losses uh, obviously are an important problem, um, and this is kind of where I would say most battery companies spend a lot of their time, uh, whether they do air cooling or liquid cooling or things like that. Um, you can't get rid of it. So, the first thing to say is that you know science works the way that science works. Okay, mm -hmm. nothing is 100% efficient, and you're always going to be generating some heat from this type of reaction. Um, so what it becomes, it becomes an interesting challenge in how do you manage that heat and how do you get it out when you want it out and have it go someplace that's safe or how do you take advantage of it when you need it. Um, and so what you get is, um, this gets into the design of the pack. So the cell itself is more or less the same structure, anode, cathode, separator, and it might be wrapped up or rolled up or something like that. But then what you put around it starts becoming the kind of a vanguard of the body. Right? And this is where, again, companies like say, Tesla that has these little cans have different ways to do it than, say, Nissan that has these, these large kind of uh, sheet-like systems. Um, so, you know, the, the short answer is you can't do anything about it. It's always going to be there. It's going to be affected by temperature, such as if you're in Alaska or not. Um, and really what you need to do is try to control it to, um, to optimize your system. Good. Okay. Thank you all.